uh, of any place that I could train, and I totally enjoyed my time here in so many ways. But Tallahassee also is very important to me because on the track at FSU is where I met my wife Barbara, and, and that was 44 years ago. And, and we. We absolutely embraced the lifestyle here in Tallahassee. Barb, do you want to say anything? I'm really grateful that Jeff would bring his shoes out to the track at Florida State. And if you were brave enough to stop and look at these brand new shoes, he would stop his workout and come over and offer you a discount card at his school at Phinipides. Which he had to go and find runners because the locations were so bad, you we weren't going to find it on your own. And I was grateful that he did that, and that's how I met him. And I started working for him because my dog ate the back of my shoe, and I knew where I needed to I could go and get a pair of running shoes. So I went to uh, Northwood Mall under the escalator. Again, you can't find a worse love running shoe location. And I bought a pair of shoes, and he said, would you like to work for me? And I said, well, I don't know really anything about running shoes. And he said, you know as much as anybody. <laughs> Nobody knew anything about running shoes at that point. It was 1975, January of 1975. And I started working for him, and he got me running into some projects. I, -dined, I think we're the first ever to have tie-dye t-shirts to all the winners of the Springtime Tallahassee track meet. I'm sure they don't have that anymore. But either do you have your tie-dye t-shirt, because we didn't know how to tie-dye a t-shirt. It looked good for about one wash. <laughs> but it wasn't tie-dye anymore, it's just off white, kind of green. But I am very appreciative to the running community in Tallahassee, because otherwise, I wouldn't know Jeff. That really creates the uh, inspiration for my first story of the night, and that is, why in the heck would I open a running store in 1973 in Tallahassee, Florida? Well, I just wanted to train here, and I was looking for an excuse as a living or as a career, and uh, a running store sounded like a, a, a good thing to do. Furthermore, my best friend in life was uh, a third employee at the Nike company, and he had opened up a store. It was an all sports shoe store, but if my friend Jeff could open up a store, surely I could too. Of course, he had a lot more financial resources than I did. But because we couldn't uh, have a budget for advertising, and we had to go with the lowest rent that we possibly could find to keep the door open, I had to go out and, and promote to bring people into the store. And that's why I brought the shoes on a blanket in the middle of the track and I would interrupt my workout when anybody came over there and took the bait for that, as Mark did. Uh, but I also, uh, on a run one day, uh, I had to stop in uh, at the old Tully Gym and uh, and, and go to a bathroom break, and I was really trying to figure out ways of bringing people into the store. And I, as I was standing there, uh, captive audience in front of the urinal, uh, the, the thought hit me. There was a blank space right there above the urinal. And I got some flyers made up, and, and that blank space was mine for a while until <laughs> the management tore it down. So there were some innovative ways that we were able to bring people in. Uh, and um, I, uh, I have to say we are still in business. We have two stores in Atlanta. Uh, we're struggling like all running stores are, but my, our uh, older son is taking over the business, so we're pitching to make this store work. Now, how many of you uh, have been running for more than five years. Uh, good veteran audience here. How many of you are just uh, just started within the last year and a half? 
Okay, so this really is mostly a veteran audience. However, newbies do not be intimidated. My mission tonight is to give each one of you information. So we'll have time for questions and answers. And I want to help you, whatever your goals are, do not be intimidated if you're new to this, because all of us work at, at one point. Uh, now, when I started training for the Olympics here in Tallahassee, I had a few things that I knew worked for me. But as I fine-tuned my training and improved, I fine-tuned and edited out things that didn't work. And what I found first that was one of the most important tools of training was to have a reality check on your goals. And I used a variety of different ways of computing what you might be capable of doing during a season. And over the generations of my years of using these assessment tools, and also in coaching now, well more than 500,000 people that I've heard from who've used my method, uh, I have come up with a tool called the Magic Mind. It is a one mile time trial, and it has more than 75,000 instances of data behind it now. And so people will report in the fastest magic mile time they had during a season. And they also have to tell us the fastest times that they ran that same season in the 5K, 10K, half, and full. So you get the data behind you, and you can very efficiently figure out what a person's potential is during a season. So we use that as our main guideline for making sure that people don't step out on a limb and try to predict a goal for a season that is simply not realistic, because that's one of the leading causes of disappointment and injury. Uh, so Magic Mile is a reality-based prediction program, and uh, also looking at the research and how people get injured, I have found a pretty safe way to keep you away from the leading cause of injury, which is going too fast on long runs. And so the rules that we have found that work for that is to really, really slow down your long run. And uh, we really haven't found any pace of a long run that's too slow. Uh, we, I've even, every year, I will coach about a dozen people who've gotten injured or they've been sick or whatever. And they predominantly walked all of the long runs during the season. And so far, every single one of these people have been able to go the distance without hitting the wall. Uh, you're going to get the same endurance even if you walk the whole uh, in, uh, distance of a long run. And this is a good default thing to remember. If you hit a wall during a long run, instead of quitting, walk the rest of it and you'll get all the distance of that long run. Uh, so the magic mile can be computed quite efficiently because you just have to go to jeffgalloway.com and there's a computation function right there. It'll compute everything for you including a safe pace for long runs, which we found to be two minutes per mile slower than is predicted in the marathon, even if your goal race for that season is not the marathon. It's always safer to slow your training pace down on long runs, and there's no liability for slowing that pace down. Uh, you get the same endurance based on the distance that you cover. Uh, now, there's one other adjustment on long runs that you need to make here in Tallahassee, and that's for the heat. Uh, you know, it's dangerous. Uh, heat in distance events is the leading cause of death, and it's way ahead of second place. And I'm against death, especially <laughs> when it relates to distance running. Uh, but it is serious stuff, folks. And if you slow the pace down enough and put the right amount of walking in terms of run, walk, run into your long runs, you lower the core body temperature increase uh, significantly and you can keep yourself in the safe zone. So the slowdown 
based on the research, is 30 seconds per mile slower for every five degrees of temperature increase above 60. So at 70 degrees, you should be running a minute per mile slower than 60. At 80 degrees, another minute per mile slower. But again, there is no pace that is too slow. And this actually, the slowdown of the long runs, is one of the items that I cite as to why I made the Olympic team in 1972. Other runners were not slowing down. Almost every single one of the athletes that I got to know on the Olympic team were running significantly faster and having significantly more problems and injuries as a result of that. I was really smug about that, even though I did tell them my secret. They often wouldn't do it. Of course, it's very difficult to tell 20-something males to do anything. Uh, but in any case, I, I, I learned early, fortunately. Uh, now, the other major uh, thing that I wanted to tell you about uh, is the run-walk-run method. Because uh, I actually started using it myself in training runs. Uh, 1970, the beginning of the school year, I was working on my master's degree here at FSU, and uh, I had trouble waking up early enough during the hot weather months of the fall. And so I find myself getting up about 9.30 or 10 in the hot months. And uh, on one occasion, it was so hot from a 20 mile towards the end, that I started hallucinating. I was looking up into the blue sky and seeing cartoon figures. And fortunately, I realized what was happening, and I simply walked the rest of that long run. But uh, it, it could have been very dangerous. That's one of those uh, signs that uh, lead to very serious consequences. So the concept of run, walk, run is that it actually gets back to what humans were designed to do. There's a really great book on human evolution called The Story of the Human Body. The Story of the Human Body. It's written by an evolutionary biologist from Harvard who spent 50 years studying this. And he and the anthropologists that study ancient man believed that our ancestors didn't do very much running at all. They walked practically everywhere they went. Why would they do this when they could run? Well, the main cause of death, until very recently for humans, has been starvation. And with limited food supply, which was the case, the uh, ancestors decided that rather than run and use up their resources at a rate of four to one, they would walk. And they produced in us the ability to be extremely efficient endurance walkers. We are endurance animals, but we're primarily designed to walk. Now running was used, uh, and it, it's believed that it was used uh, in a strategic form of hunting by our ancient ancestors. It's called persistence hunting. You can look this up in anthropology text. But uh, in this form of, uh, of hunting, uh, ancestors would uh, creep up on an animal that they wanted for dinner and realize that they're hunting in Africa in the heat of the day because that's when the predators didn't come out. And uh, so they, they sneak up on an animal they wanted for dinner and they'd start jogging towards the animal. The animal would get spooked and take off so they would walk to recover and then start jogging towards the animal again. And over several hours, the animal that doesn't have sweat glands would overheat, keel over, and dinner would be served. And uh, it, so really what, what our ancestors were doing is they were using a form of run, walk, run. That's the type of motion that the anthropologist cite is what we were designed to do. We weren't designed for running non-stop for long distances, and when people do that, most of them get injured because something breaks. It's simply not designed to do it. The good news is that with Run, Walk, Run, 
You can erase the buildup of stress on weak links. You can save the resources in your energy supply. You can also save your muscles so that they're strong all the way to the end. You can recover faster and you can even run faster in races. And you should be proud of Run, Walk, Run Method because it was invented here in Tallahassee. Right after I had opened my store. Absolutely. Right after I opened my store, uh, a guy came in who ran a community project for FSU for nonprofit, I mean non-credit courses open to the community just to get knowledge in a given area. And as we were talking, as I was fitting him with a pair of shoes, he suggested that I teach a course in beginning running. Well, I was looking for customers. I needed customers really bad. So I said, absolutely. And the uh, first class had 22 in it. And when I interviewed every single one of them, I realized that none of them had been doing any running for at least five years. This was truly novices. So very quickly on some preliminary walks with little jogs, I divided the group up into three different subgroups, and each workout, uh, three times a week, I went out with every group and made sure they took walk breaks from the beginning, because I didn't want to get them injured. I mean, I wanted to get them in the store and get them in some shoes. So uh, we went out there every day, every uh, other day, and uh, at the end of the 10-week course, every one of them finished 5K or 10K. But what impressed me most, no injuries. I had never been with a group of 20 or more runners for two months or more where there weren't any injuries at all. And I strongly suspected that it was the run wall run that was doing this. And I have used the method ever since, and we have certainly fine-tuned it ever since. Uh, fine-tuned it based on the fact that over the last 32, 33 years, I have averaged about 100 emails a day. Almost all of them have questions. And so I give each one of them an answer to the problem they're having. It almost always involves a run, walk, run strategy. And so as the returns come in, because most of them do get back to me within the next six months, and so as I process the returns as to how various configurations of running and walking work, I then tabulate the most efficient based on the pace per mile. So it, it, the method has evolved over the years. We used to, back in the 70s and 80s, have minutes of running with a minute of walking. Well, that's gone. The new frontier is seconds of running and seconds of walking. We have discovered that uh, the maximum walk break for benefit is only 30 seconds. And if you walk longer than that, you actually slow down during the second half of a run or certainly a race. And it becomes harder and harder to restart again. So now based on our data, this is what we found that works best for run, walk, run amounts. At a nine minute per mile pace, run two minutes and walk 30 seconds. At 10 minutes per mile, run 90 seconds and walk 30 seconds. At 11 and 12 minutes per mile, run 60 seconds, walk 30 seconds, or 45 seconds running and 30 seconds of walking, or even 30-30. At 13 and 14 minutes per mile, it's 30-30, 20-20, or 15-15. And Barbara and I are still running a marathon every month. Yes, at our advanced age, we're running a marathon every month. And we have gravitated down to 1515 because we found that not only can we run a marathon every month without injury, but we can run the next day in most cases. It's phenomenal what these short segments will do for you. And I have not had a running injury in over 40 years. I don't even knock on wood anymore. Because since I started seriously using Run, Walk, Run, the injuries have gone away. And I am not alone. I hear from 
dozens of people every week that have been running over two decades with no injuries also. And this can be you too. So uh, one more thing that I wanted to uh, touch on, and that is the length of the long run, regardless of what uh, distance of an event that you're training for, I found without a doubt that at least going up to the distance of that event is going to be helpful in avoiding the wall. Um, another way of putting it is most people tend, and we have numerous surveys on this, most people tend to hit the wall within one mile of their longest run within the last two to three weeks. And this is something you, you can change uh, by going up to at least the distance. And here's the time benefit in a marathon. Those who used to run 20 miles as their longest run, when they go up to our recommendation of 26 miles three weeks before the marathon, the average improvement over a 20 mile longest run is 15 minutes faster. 15 minutes. And those who used to run 26 miles but want to qualify for Boston or set a personal record and go up to our recommendation of 29 miles, improve another average of 11 more minutes. Three more miles, 11 minutes of time improvement. So there's a lot of good things out there. Now, how many of you ran either the half or the full this past weekend? How many of you are feeling a little sore? <laughs> or worse? <laughs> well, I, I brought a tool with me today uh, that has really helped people in those situations. It's called, of all things, the BFF. It's a vibrating massage tool, and it's located right behind me back at the wall here. Uh, it looks like it is a car buffer, but it's actually a body buffer. It's this green machine right here. So if you're interested, come on back, and what you do is turn on the red button on the top, find the area that's sore, have a few seconds of warm up, and then turn it up on its side into the area that's sore. It is totally different than the foam roller or the stick. Those two devices hurt, and they move junk out of a given area. And they, they, they have a role. What this does is bring blood flow in to help heal. It also invigorates the soft tissue like you would not believe. You've got to try it. It is, it is a fantastic instrument, and it can definitely speed up recovery. Um, so I wanted to uh, go through very quickly some recovery methods this week, uh, especially if you did the marathon.